One of the main skills that an academic education teaches people is the ability to talk about subjects they know barely anything about while sounding like an expert. This can be dangerous insofar as it enables the spread of misinformation. There are numerous examples of grifters with academic credentials who use their perceived epistemic authority to distort the general population's perception of reality. Someone might be surprised that a person as wrong as Ben Shapiro attended Harvard Law School, but it is precisely the fact that Shapiro attended Harvard which helps to explain why he's able to be so wrong in such a rhetorically persuasive manner. The same is true for people with PhDs and academic careers. Jordan Peterson earned a PhD from McGill University in clinical psychology and subsequently taught at Harvard and Toronto. Despite being a psychologist with bizarre views on women and chaos, he nonetheless feels compelled to publicly make things up about subjects he has not studied, such as climate change or Marx. He speaks extremely confidently, and so lots of people believe him. It might be inferred from examples like this that, although one should not trust what an academic says about a topic outside of their field, they should be deferred to when discussing their area of expertise. This rule is motivated by a true claim. Someone who has read hundreds of books about a topic, such as the history of socialism, will know more about it than someone who has never read anything on the subject. Yet this general rule does not mean that academics should be automatically believed. One of the main features of any academic discipline is academics constantly disagreeing and arguing with one another. What one academic regards as obviously correct, another believes is outdated and wrong. This especially happens over time as new books and journal articles appear that overturn the previous academic consensus or dominant position. It is furthermore the case that the truth does not care about academic credentials. The beliefs that a person with a PhD expresses are only as good as their arguments, evidence, interpretation of said evidence, citations, sources, and so on. I am a historian of political thought. When reading about history, I often discover that extremely well-educated people who teach at prestigious universities have made basic factual errors in their books. In this discipline, it is normal for specialists to reasonably disagree with one another about a wide variety of topics, such as what a source is really saying, if an eyewitness is reliable or not, or what causal factor is most important. The errors I find are not matters of interpretation and debate. They are simply mistakes. In this essay, I will go through a number of examples from famous authors. Orlando Figgs earned his PhD from the University of Cambridge and was Professor of History at Birkbeck College, University of London. His book, A People's Tragedy, The Russian Revolution, 1891-1924, is described as a masterpiece, or magnum opus, by the glowing reviews from journalists that appear in its first two pages. In the book, Figgs asserts that Marx learned Russian in order to read the novel What is to be Done by Nikolai Chernyshevsky. Of the five sources that Figgs cites for this section of the book, I was only able to find four of them. These four sources do not say anything about why Marx learned Russian in the referenced page numbers. One of the cited books claims elsewhere that Marx learned Russian and admired Chernyshevsky, but does not connect the two facts together. I have been unable to find a single primary or secondary source which supports Figg's assertion. The Marx biographer David McLennan claims that a study of the evolution of agriculture in Russia was intended to illuminate Marx's ideas on ground rent in Volume 3 of Capital, in the same way as English industrial development provided the practical examples to the ideas expounded in Volume 1. Marx had learnt Russian specifically to be able to study the original sources. McLennan's narrative is supported by the primary sources. Marx wrote in an 1877 letter that 
In order to reach an informed judgment on the economic development of contemporary Russia, I learned Russian and then spent several long years studying official publications and others with a bearing on this subject. He appears to have started learning Russian in 1869. On the 30th of October of that year, Jenny, who was Marx's daughter, wrote a letter to Ludwig Kugelmann in which she reported that Marx sends you his kind regards and hopes you will excuse his not writing to you as at the present moment he is very busy reading a book which has just appeared in the Russian language and the reading of which gives him no small amount of trouble on the condition of the Russian peasantry. The book that Marx was reading was not a novel. It was N. Florovsky's The Condition of the Working Class in Russia. Marx informed Engels in a 23rd October letter that I have been sent from St. Petersburg a thick 500-page Florovsky volume on the condition of the Russian peasants and workers, unfortunately in Russian. A month later, on November 29th, Marx told Kugelman that in order to read the book he was having to grind at Russian. Marx's progress at reading this book was surprisingly fast, given that he had only just started learning the language. In early February 1870, he told Engels that, I have read the first 150 pages of Florovsky's book. After roughly a year of reading Russian, Marx was much more confident in his powers. On the 21st of January 1871, he told Siegfried Mayer in a letter that, I don't know whether I told you that since the beginning of 1870 I have been having to teach myself Russian, which I now read fairly fluently. This came about after I had been sent Florovsky's very important work on the condition of the working class, especially the peasants, in Russia from St. Petersburg. I also wanted to familiarise myself with the excellent economic works of Chernyshevsky, who was rewarded by being sentenced to the Siberian mines for the past seven years. The result was worth the effort that a man of my age must make to master a language differing so greatly from the classical Germanic and Romance languages. In this passage, Marx is very explicit that he read the economic works of Chernyshevsky, rather than his novel, a few years later, Marx recommended Chernyshevsky's Outlines of Political Economy, according to Mill, in the 1873 afterword to the second German edition of Capital Volume 1. There is some indirect evidence that Marx read Chernyshevsky's novel, but this does not appear until several years after he first learned Russian. In December 1872, he considered writing an overview of Chernyshevsky's life and thought, but ended up abandoning this project. A month later, he wrote to Nikolai Danielson, who was his main provider of Russian books. As to Chernyshevsky, it entirely depends on you whether I confine myself wholly to his scientific work or touch on his other activities as well. In the second volume of my book, he will, of course, only appear as an economist. I am familiar with a major part of his writings. Marx does not specify if this included fiction. I searched through every volume of the Marx and Engels collected works from 1869 onwards and was only able to find one occasion where Marx made a reference to Chernyshevsky's novel. In July 1878, Marx wrote in a letter, What is to be done, as the Russians say. This is of course not definitive proof that Marx actually read the novel since it is possible that he heard or read the phrase being used by Russians and decided to copy it. For example, in 1875, Engels responded to a Russian revolutionary who used the phrase. Even if it is assumed that this shows that Marx read the novel, it does not support Figgs's assertion, since at this point in time, Marx's Russian was very proficient. All other usages of the phrase that appear are clearly not references to the book, such as when Engels told Marx, you or your wife can of course decide what is to be done with the money.
Given the above evidence, it is clear that Marx learned Russian in order to study the country's economics. Figs makes an assertion about why Marx chose to learn Russian, but did not bother to look through the indexes of the Marx and Engels collected works in order to verify this information. If he had done so, he would have avoided making a mistake. This kind of error does not appear to be a rare occurrence for Figs. In 2012, the academics Peter Radaway and Stephen F. Curran wrote an article for The Nation in which they claimed that Figs's book, The Whisperers, Private Life in Stalin's Russia, had its translation into Russian cancelled by the publishers. This occurred after researchers at the Memorial Society, which is a human rights organisation dedicated to the victims of Stalin, were hired to help with the translation, but ended up discovering a huge number of minor and major factual errors in Figs's work. The chief researcher at Memorial is reported to have said, I wept as I read it and tried to make corrections. I gave only a few examples, but the entire text is like this. It's even difficult to choose examples, they appear throughout. Jonathan Sperber is Professor Emeritus at the University of Missouri. He received his PhD from the University of Chicago and has published 12 books, most of which are about the social and political history of 19th century Europe. In 2013, he published Karl Marx and 19th Century Life. The book received rave reviews from the mainstream press and was even a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for biography. The journalist Jonathan Friedland described it as meticulously researched in a review for the New York Times. The book also contains a number of basic factual errors that could have been easily avoided if Sperber had looked things up. In chapter 2, Sperber asserts that Hegel and Kant were both lifelong bachelors married, as it were, to the ethereal world of philosophy. He provides no source for this claim. The book's bibliography contains a single book with Kant's name in the title, and this is a book about the history of anti-Semitism. I checked the book just in case and could not find anything about Kant's personal life. Sperber's endnotes for chapter 2 reference two books on Hegel and his followers. Neither of these books appear to make any claims about whether Hegel was married or not. It is common for academics to not provide page references for a fact which is widely known about, such as the fact that World War II happened or that horses exist. But it is important to provide page references for biographical claims about famous philosophers. This is because, like with any famous person, there are a lot of claims that are repeated about them which are only myth and legend. It is true that Kant was a lifelong bachelor who never married, or, as far as we know, had sex. But the same is not true of Hegel. Hegel, unlike the probably asexual King Kant, got laid. Sperber is aware of this, since he refers to the claim that Hegel fathered an illegitimate child with a barmaid. There are, however, two major problems with Sperber's description of Hegel's sex life. First, the woman Hegel had an illegitimate child with in 1807 was not to my knowledge a barmaid. She was Christiana Charlotte Johanna Burkhardt, his landlady and housekeeper. Second, Hegel married Marie von Tucker in September 1811. The fact Hegel married is also mentioned in the standard introductions to Hegel such as those by Tom Rockmore, Frederick Beiser, and Stephen Howgate. Sperber, to his credit, fixed this error in later printings of the book. But it is not the only factual error that he made. He claims that Marx and Engels met in person for the first time in August 1844, whilst Marx was living in Paris. This is false. Marx and Engels met in person for the first time in November 1842, whilst Marx was editor of the Rhineland News and lived in Cologne. In 1895, Engels recalled that 
When I dropped in again towards the end of November, on my way to England, I ran into Marks there, and that was the occasion of our first, distinctly chilly, meeting. Sperber should know about this because he references David McLennan and Francis Wien's biographies of Marx several times. Both McLennan and Wien very clearly mention this fact just before discussing Marx and Engels' second meeting in Paris. Although I've cited McLennan's biography of Marx twice in this essay, that does not mean that it is perfect and free from factual errors. McLennan completed his PhD at Oxford and went on to become the Professor of Political Theory at the University of Kent and then Goldsmiths College, University of London. He has written several good books about the theory and history of Marx specifically, and Marxism in general. He also makes mistakes. McLennan claims that Marx's school grades were as follows. Latin and Greek verse were good, his religion satisfactory, his French and mathematics weak, and his history, strangely, weakest of all. When I first read this, I believed it, and assumed it was true because there was no way McLennan would get something so simple wrong. I was amazed that Marx, who would go on to develop one of the most influential theories of history in history, had done badly in history at school. I thought it said something about how school grades are not destiny, and people can grow and improve as they age. I even posted this fact on Twitter with a supporting page reference, only to be told by strangers on the internet that I was wrong. I could not believe this, and looked up Marx's school grades for myself, only to discover that the strangers on the internet were right. The certificate he received at the age of 17 upon passing his exams and leaving school claimed that he has good aptitudes, and, in ancient languages, German, and history, showed a very satisfactory diligence, in mathematics, satisfactory, and in French, only slight diligence. From this it is clear that teenage Marx did very well in history, and that his worst subject was actually French. McLennan made this mistake because he repeated what another secondary source said, at the time of writing, the Marx and Engels collected works in English, and Mega 2, which is the second version of the Marx and Engels complete works, had yet to be published. A reader might respond to this essay by describing me as a pedant, to which I would reply that this is true. I would, in addition to this, point out that I am much more pedantic with myself than with anyone else. I have a PhD in the history of anarchism, and care about citations so much that even my Instagram posts include page references. I drove myself crazy double-checking all 1,260 endnotes in my book, which you can now buy if you want, over the course of an entire month. In addition to this, I double-checked every single date in the book was correct, and that every single quote was typed out correctly. I cannot begin to describe how boring it was to do this. This was the second time I had done this, and yet I still found errors that had to be fixed. There is a part of me that wanted to do it a third time just in case. Although I am a perfectionist, this does not mean that my book is perfect. As anyone who has listened to me on a podcast misremember something I read several years ago knows, I also make mistakes. In chapter 1 of my book I write that, Bakunin first publicly called himself an anarchist in August 1867 in The Slavic Question. This is false. The article was published in two parts. The first part appeared on the 31st of August, and the second part on the 8th of September. The passage in which Bakunin calls himself an anarchist is from the second part published in September. I should have given September as the month because I am referring to when a statement was publicly made, rather than when Bakunin privately wrote it prior to its publication. I made this mistake because I did not read an endnote carefully enough. The writing of history is, to a significant extent, built on trust. No historian has the time or energy to thoroughly fact-check every single book they read, nor is total fact-checking always possible, since often the source for a claim is in an archive in a different country, or in a language that one cannot read. As a result, 
historians generally have to trust that another historian did the work properly and is accurately reporting the information that they found. But I find it hard to trust the work of other historians because I've been heard too many times. On several occasions, I have investigated a claim only to find out that what I thought was a rational conclusion drawn from a serious and thorough evaluation of the evidence was actually an arbitrary opinion, a pure fabrication, or a misreading of a source. Whenever I discover that another historian has made an error, it plants a seed of doubt in my mind. If Sperber was so wrong about Hegel's sex life, and did such little research into such an important topic, then how can I trust anything he says about any topic? This is why I love it when historians quote primary sources at length. I no longer need to take their word for it, and can instead see and assess the evidence for myself. Academia is full of what could be called the aesthetics of scholarship. A person writes confidently and cites a large number of sources, and so must know what they are talking about. Another person is given a professorship with a ridiculously long title, and so is clearly one of the best in their field. It is sometimes difficult to tell the difference between someone who is an expert and someone who has learned to write like an expert. It can be easy for academics to believe in and internalise these aesthetics to the point that they mistake their opinions for knowledge. They must be right about a topic because they are a big-brained person who did well at school, went to an elite university, got a PhD in the field, published articles in top peer-reviewed journals, and so on. At this point, academic qualifications shift from evidence that a person has seriously studied a topic to what is, for all intents and purposes, an appeal to authority. Such mental narratives ignore that intelligence does not guarantee correctness, and often just enable a person to be wrong in a very elaborate manner. Academics should of course be read if you want to learn about a topic. Researching even a small question can take years of dedicated work, and so it is worthwhile to read what the people who have done this work have to say. The acquisition of knowledge is a collective effort, and the research of one person is always built on the efforts of a huge number of other people. Life is short, and you're going to die. Every decision to devote time towards learning about one topic takes away time that could have been spent on another topic. It is not possible to become an expert on everything, and so we have no choice but to rely on the expertise of others. But academics should also be read critically and sceptically. When reading history, I try to apply two general rules. First, if a historian does not have a supporting source, do not automatically believe them or take their word for it. As Wikipedia puts it, citation needed. Second, even if a historian has a source, keep in mind that the source could not be saying any of the points they make, or could include information that contradicts them. In other words, just because a sentence ends with a citation, does not mean it is true or grounded in any evidence. I hope you enjoyed listening to this video. On my website, I have a page where I list every single factual error in my book that I discover, or which is pointed out to me with supporting references. If you enjoyed this video, please follow me on Instagram and support me on Patreon so I can survive under capitalism. I am currently writing two books, a history of anarchism versus Marxism debates, and an anarchist history of the state. As part of this research, I am writing a massive video about how Marx became a communist, which is going to be my longest video yet, by far. This work is only possible thanks to everyone who supports me on Patreon. Thanks so much, have a nice day everyone, goodbye.